business. Uh, today we will consider the statements made by the Minister of Finance. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. Thank you very much indeed. I would now like to declare the meeting open to the public. And I would like to inform members that the following members will be joining the meeting through teleconferencing. Pat Catney. Hi, Pat. Hello, sir. Yep. And we're expecting Matthew O'Toole to come online at some stage. I'll ask the members to ensure that their electronic devices are switched to mute mode when they aren't speaking in order to ensure quality of sound recording. Members, if we're content, I'll proceed through the agenda. First of all, uh, no pol apologies have been received. I think we probably have from Sean. Have we received mm -hmm. an apology from Sean? Or I'm willing to record an apology from Sean, from Sean yeah. in view of the circumstances. Uh, members of the committee, uh, some of you may not be aware that uh, Sean's father passed away at the weekend. And I would like, as the chairman, and I'm sure as the vice chair and the rest of the committee, would like to pass on our condolences to Sean and his family. And uh, may I have that uh, recorded, please, Mr. Clark? I'd also like to thank, uh, as you'll notice, that we don't have our normal clerk, Jim McManus, with us. And I'd like to thank Peter for uh, stepping in and supporting the committee today during this meeting. And we wish Jim all the best. His wife is currently suffering some, some of the issues to do with COVID-19. And we wish them a, a swift and rapid recovery. And we look forward to seeing Jim again soon. Uh, if we'd like to move on to the, sort of the oral evidence, it's the reported joint order for personal protective equipment between the Department of Finance and Government of the Republic of Ireland. I would like to remind members the agenda item is reported by Hansard. And I would like to call in now uh, Minister uh, Colin Murphy and Sue Gray, if we could bring him through. Hi, Sue. Hi, Connor. Take your seat. Uh, welcome, Connor. Welcome, Sue. And thank you very much indeed for coming before the committee today. And obviously, uh, we will endeavour to keep this within the 75 minutes as has been outlined by the speaker. But thank you very much indeed for taking time out of your busy days and bearing in mind the sort of the issues that are ongoing at the moment. Sure, we don't. wouldn't be calling this unless we considered it was an important issue. I would like to inform the members that the meeting is to discuss the statements made by the Minister in respect of a joint order with the Government of the Republic of Ireland in respect of personal protection equipment. Uh, the Committee will receive evidence of this matter from the Minister and the Permanent Secretary. I will draw the members' attention to questions raised by the Deputy Chairperson in relation to the joint order, which is at page 6 of your papers. I would also draw your attention to the full official record of the Ministerial Statements on the Budget 2021 which includes references to PPE and a joint order which has been placed. This is a response to Mr O'Toole and Mr Given on page 7. You may also wish to consider other items within the Hansard record, uh, members of the committee, particularly from statements made by the Justice Minister and also from the uh, Deputy First Minister, which could possibly bring Jimmy into this as well. I would like to draw members' attention to tables items which include a copy of the recent uh, Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland MOU, which I believe Connor was signed yesterday. The MOU. To the health ministers, the MOU. Uh, I, like most people, this, these days we're losing track of days, but it was done in recent days anyway. Yeah, okay. Which is agreed. I believe it was agreed with health ministers in both jurisdictions. Uh, I would like ask you to note, in response to questions on the statement, the minister made at least two references to a joint order with the ROI government for PPE. He indicated that the joint order had been placed. Incemented that the order had not been secured and referred to issues that had not yet to be resolved, including quantities and specifications of PPE, as well as the potential for competition with other jurisdictions. I'd also like you to note the Irish Times article on Saturday, the 4th of April 2020, refers to the order not being placed or have indeed having fallen through. There does not seem to have appeared to have been at this stage a formal statement in this regard to the Oireachtas. Uh, the HSE or the Department of Health websites, although it is understood that oral comments of this were made to these organisations through the press. And I think that was Dr Honrahan, who is the, uh, the Irish Republic's Chief Medical Officer, had made those statements in the press on the 3rd. Uh, Minister, would you care to make an opening statement? 
Sure. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, set out our, I suppose, role in relation to supporting the Department of Health uh, in procurement issues. Uh, just by way of context, since the emergence of the public health crisis, my department has developed a budget allocating $12.2 billion in resource and $1.6 billion in capital. We have allocated the vast majority of the $933 million COVID response fund. Uh, there is more discussion on that to conclude this evening with executive colleagues. We have worked with other departments, developed multiple schemes aimed at mitigating the social and economic impacts of the pandemic, liaised with Treasury on its new economic schemes, produced new procurement guidelines so that uh, contractors and subcontractors will be paid promptly. And we worked with the economy and the infrastructure ministers to press the Department for Transport on support packages for our airports. We have also managed through the Department, I think, to increase from 100 laptops a week output to 700 laptops a week output uh, to ensure that more and more public servants can work from home. Uh, so it's been an extremely busy time for the Department. Uh, I, and despite that, I did offer to assist the Department of Health uh, at the start of this pandemic with its procurement generally and specifically in relation to its procurement for PPE. I did so for a number of reasons. Firstly, there are a number of vital public services, including forensic science, the coroner's service, the prison service and the PSNI, that the Department of Health was not providing PPE for. And I wanted to ensure that these crucial services were helped obtain the protection they deserve. Secondly, frontline <coughs> health and social care workers were telling me, and I'm sure many of you, that they were not being provided with PPE. I wanted to ensure that every effort was made to supply those workers with PPE. And third, the scale and the seriousness of the crisis was such that it made sense to pool our resources. On Thursday, the 19th of March, the Department of Finance offered assistance, and on Monday, the 23rd of March, it was agreed that the procurement teams in Health and Finance would work together. The next day, my department set up a system to check offers of help from local suppliers and share these with health and other sectors. Local supply is crucial because of the difficulties involved in transporting goods by air uh, and by sea. Increasing local capacity will also help maintain economic activity in the short term and also help with the economic recovery on the other side of the crisis. To date, we have had over 300 offers from suppliers, including obviously blocked lines and O'Neill's, to help produce PPE. Orders have been placed for over 50 million examination gloves, nearly 20 million aprons, over 5 million fluid resistant masks, and over 2.3 million face shields. Delivery is expected in the coming days and weeks. We have also established a multidisciplinary team to work directly with local manufacturers, offering to repurpose and produce PPE. Invest NI is working closely with us on this. The next step is to provide a longer term PPE, pipeline of PPE requirements so that suppliers have the certainty they need to gear up and meet demand. As we take some time for local companies to ramp up supply, my department have been exploring additional sources of PPE. I will come to our work with the British Government in a moment. My officials advised me that because the Irish Government had already successfully placed substantial orders in China, it made sense to explore joint orders with them. Dublin agreed to place orders with us, but before proceeding, my officials contacted Cabinet Office to clarify whether they had sufficient PPE to supply here to the North. On Friday, the 27th of March, Cabinet Office advised us to proceed with the order with the Irish Government. Following that advice, my department forwarded to Dublin detailed requirements for orders which would have provided sufficient PPE for a number of months. Arrangements were put in train to process a payment of around £170 million over the weekend. During the following week, it became increasingly clear that countries with larger buying power had entered the market and started to secure orders from the same factories that Dublin had been already progressing. On Tuesday, I informed the Assembly that I would release further details of the order I had placed with Dublin once I could ensure that we have the right order secured and on its way home. I spoke to the Health Minister about the difficulties on Tuesday night, and our procurement teams held a joint meeting the following day. And on Thursday, the 2nd of April, despite the best efforts all involved, I received confirmation that the order would not, in fact, be fulfilled through that route. The truth is, we needed to be in the market a couple of weeks earlier. But I have not given up. The executive through our Bureau and Invest NI officials on the ground in China are now attempting to complete the orders through a different supplier, and those efforts are ongoing. In the meantime, Minister Swan and I have requested a portion of the recent consignment of items delivered to Dublin from China on the basis that this will be returned once we complete our order. The Health and Finance Departments have also been working to procure PPE and other supplies from the British Government. My Permit Secretary's contracts in Whitehall have proved extremely helpful in that regard. Last week, we were both in direct contact with senior Department of Health officials in England to ensure that a consignment of PPE was provided. Approximately 5.5 million items in total will be delivered, and the first batch 
uh, arrived on Monday past. As the Health Minister said earlier this week, there's not a country in the world that can definitively say it has enough PPE in stock, given the uncertainty about the path this virus will take. We are therefore continuing at pace to pursue all feasible PPI supply routes, both international and local. I began by outlining some of the important work that my officials and the Department have delivered during this crisis. I'd like to finish by thanking the procurement teams in both health and finance who are working round the clock at pace and under considerable pressure to secure essential supplies for frontline workers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister, and thank you very much indeed for the information you've given us. Um, and I, for one, welcome the opportunity to engage with local manufacturers and work with our local manufacturing base to manufacture PPE and move on with that as well. I also welcome very much from the rest of our country the considerable number of PPE that has been delivered, particularly this week. And I believe what sort of about 4.9 million items have arrived in the sort of the last three to four days. And what I understand today, there's about three or four container loads that are about to arrive presently coming off a ferry, which will considerably add to our stocks. But indeed, as the health minister has made clear, we are dealing not only with what we're, the situation we have now, but what is likely to happen in the future. So we need to build up those stocks. And I think, as all MLAs will be fully aware, we're beginning to see across the whole sector that we need to have a significant area of PPE. That's not really what this question is about, Minister. This question is what was being told to the Assembly and what was the information that was being given to us. And indeed, if we hark back to the 23rd of March and indeed what was being said at the time, and the Justice Minister, I think, from I recollect, but I can look at Hansard to do it as well. The Justice Minister had made clear that there was a order of PPE that was on its way, particularly, I think, which was scheduled to go to the PSNI and the prison service. And later on during that meeting, or during that day in the Assembly, the, the Deputy First Minister had made clear that this not only was in contract, it was an order and it was expected to come. So there was more than an expectation amongst health workers in Northern Ireland that when the various flights were arriving in Dublin, this uh, PPE equipment was on its way. And I think all of us would say very clearly that what we want to see is PPE for our people here in Northern Ireland to be able to deal with the situation as well. So the question we have, and the question I have, is can you run me through the timeline? Who did you actually order the materials off? When was the contract raised? Where did you get the information from, from the various departments and what did they want to order? And bearing in mind this is a significant, significantly large bulk order, why were you not aware, Minister, that the contract hadn't been fulfilled and wasn't likely to be fulfilled? But please, I would like to hear your views on that. Well, firstly, can I say in relation to that, I mean, you, you, you made an accusation yesterday in the Chamber that I misled the Assembly. Uh, and I note when you're quoting what people have said in the Assembly that you haven't, you haven't quoted from me at all. Because very clearly, and I can, I can go through the answers that I answered from last Tuesday when I spoke to the Assembly, very clearly I, I expressed a series of caveats about ensuring that this was in place and would be fulfilled, and I wouldn't give detail until I was sure it was on the ground. Uh, but you made, an order, you made a, a statement yesterday that I had misled the Assembly, and you said, uh, if, if I can quote you, you said that, uh, bearing in mind in this House last week, we had the Finance Minister come in and speak to us, who informed us that not only was PPE on its way from a joint order with the Irish Republic, that it was due to arrive shortly. I never uttered those words. I never uttered those words in any public commentary in the Assembly, and Hansard bears testament to that. I never uttered those words in any public statement or any public reference that I made to this entire issue. So, in fact, if, I mean, you were accusing me of misleading the Assembly, you, in fact, misled the Assembly yesterday, because you, you uttered words on behalf of me that were not uttered by me at any stage. And uh, now when you're putting this question to me in relation to the veracity of things that were said, you're quoting the Justice Minister and the Deputy First Minister. You are also members of the Northern Ireland Executive. But nothing that I said. Well, to be quite honest, when we had a discussion of this at the Executive meeting and the Justice Minister said that she believed a contract had been signed, I asked her where she had heard that from, and she said on media or on Twitter. So it wasn't from me at all. And the Deputy First Minister's uh, public uh, pronunciation of this in relation to the fact that an order had been placed was in fact correct. We had in fact placed an order. In no stage did I mention anything about signing contracts. I said we had placed an order on the day that that had happened. So can I take you through the timeline? So just to be clear. So just to, just, just to be clear. Just, sir, just, just, Minister, just for one second. 
So what's the difference between placing an order and signing a contract? I'm not I'm confused. Well, what what I've said in the executive or in the in the press briefing on the Friday evening, the twenty or the twentieth of March I think it was, that the we had agreed to place an order with Dublin. And you did place an and order with Dublin. And we had we had we had sent them they they were the people who were managing the order. We were the people who were if you like piggybacking into their already established supply chain, which I was advised was the most certain route that we could find at that moment in time into China in terms of delivery, because it was already starting to deliver that weekend uh, for the South in terms of supply. Uh, when you said you placed an order with Dublin, what what did we place? We we sent down Dublin the extent of our requirements, the totality of our requirements, and said this was our portion of the order that they were placing. Uh, and we had placed that order with them to add to their order and to be placed with China. So we had agreed that. We had sent them our requirements. They were dispatched from the Department of Health. The approval in terms of the money that would be required to pay for that was, was done through the Department of Health. We uh, were in the process in the early part of the, the following week uh, of transferring that money when we became aware that there was a question mark over the supply lines that they had established. We were aware when we placed it that there was a likelihood that the United States and India and other bigger economic powers were going to come into the market. We thought at that stage uh, advice that the, the, there might be a, a week or two before that was the fact. It in fact happened on the Monday that they came into the market and started to buy up entire supply lines. So we had placed an order with Dublin. We were in the process of supplying with the money for them to conclude that order. And then, as the week wore on, it became more and more obvious that there was a difficulty. There were some days that we were getting more positive soundings from China, and other days that we were getting more negative soundings. And it was on Thursday afternoon that we concluded that pursuing that route to try and get the supply wasn't uh, going to work the way we had intended. But you will accept the fact that the Deputy First Minister and the Justice Minister were under the opinion that uh, not only had the order been placed, but it was due to be delivered which would have implied that there had been a contract signed and it was on its way. Well, I can't account for the interpretation of what I say by other people, including yourself, who has interpreted what I said and put uh, even further, because uh, you said it was due very soon, according to your interpretation. I, I can't understand where you got that information from. The more that I can understand uh, what caused people to utter certain words. My advice was very clear on the Friday. We had placed an order. With Dublin, we had sent down the details of that order, and we were making a, a, an arrangement to transfer pay, pay uh, for that. Now, what other people choose to interpret that and, and inform others in relation to it, yourself included, uh, is not something that I am in control of. I can only be in, uh, accountable and responsible for words that I utter myself. If I take you back to the comments made by the Deputy First Minister, and I appreciate the fact that Shay, you are not putting her words into her mouth, but of course you are part of all the executive together. In her commentary to Colin McGrath indeed, on the 23rd of March, she said, At a meeting this morning, we were told through finance that we were able to secure a contract for additional PPE. That is good news. But you have just told me you did not have a contract. Who is right, the Deputy First Minister or you? Well, you would have to ask the Deputy First Minister how she chose to interpret that. I, say, I was very clear. We had placed an order. Uh, you, yourself, suggest that in your view, of how business is done. If you place an order, you have signed a contract. So perhaps the Deputy First Minister had the same uh, understanding of the placing of an order as you do. Uh, I was very clear what I said, that we had placed an order with Dublin. We were making arrangements to make a payment for that order. It was part of their joint order that they were taking on an already established supply line from China to this island. Uh, I was advised that, that was the most secure route that we could follow. Uh, so if others choose to interpret that as a contract when signed, that is not something that I ever uttered. So to just to get this correct, that the Deputy First Minister is saying at a meeting that she was told through finance that if we were able to secure a contract for additional PPE, this is good news. As far as you're concerned, that wasn't actually a contract and that wasn't anything definitive, even though the Deputy First Minister said it in the Assembly. Well, as I say, you chose to interpret that I said there was an order placed, that that meant there was a contract signed. That, that's your interpretation. No, she says no, we have I'm been able to your original, secure a contract. I'm going back to your original opening comments. And I'm saying where sometimes the misunderstanding arises. In your view, the placing of an order means the signing of a contract. Perhaps the Deputy First Minister had the same view. In my clear view, that the placing of an order meant that we had sent our requirements to Dublin. They were processing that order alongside their own. And if the uh, materials were secured, then the payment would be made. We were transferring the money to Dublin. 
to uh, ensure that our payments were ready to be made. Uh, should, and it was not a single order, it was a multiple of orders from a, a, a multitude of suppliers, uh, but they were managing that alongside Invest NI, people on the ground in China. So your contention is that members of the Assembly and the Deputy First Minister misread the interpretation of what you said, and in fact a contract hadn't been signed, and there wasn't an expectation that any of this PPE would arrive? It's, my contention is that I said what I said, what others said, including yourself, and you need to provide an explanation for how you interpreted it in that way. I think, well, the question is, how does the Deputy First Minister, the Justice Minister and members of this committee consider your words as you went through? Minister? Well, only you, only you can answer for that. I mean, what I'm saying to you here is my words are on the record. Uh, they were very clear in what I said. As a matter of fact, I answered a number of questions last Tuesday in relation to this matter in the Assembly, where I give a range of caveats as to the uncertainty that was then going on in relation to that, about securing the order, about ensuring it was there, about not declaring what was there, because I was conscious of the impact in terms of the uh, public servants, the people on the front line uh, who would want to see this order arriving, but not to build up those hopes, because I was conscious that these things were not certain. I, I expressed a range of, of caveats in relation to that, and my answers are not a record and answered. So, if people then choose to disregard that in this committee and interpret it in their own way, then it's not something that I can really help you with. Mm. I think, um, and just before I move on to the next set of questions, I think what we're expecting to see across the whole of the Northern Ireland Executive is a joined up approach. And I think there's a reasonable expectation that the people of Northern Ireland would expect when the Deputy First Minister and the Justice Minister refers to the fact that a contract has been signed and it has on its way. And also, if we look at some of the media statements, and I think one of the media statements you you may say it was misquoted. One of the no, media I don't statements say it was misquoted. Says, I have all the media statements where I was quoted, and I'm saying to you quite clearly, I never at any stage said a contract has been signed. I never at any stage said this material is on its way. This material will arrive soon. These are these are things you've you've attributed to me. Never said at any stage in any public commentary, either in the chamber or outside the chamber. So, I mean, if you have built up a level of expectation of what has developed here, and now you're asking me to explain on your behalf. The expectation you've publicly created, I think that's a matter for yourself. Mm. Paul? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Can I ask the Permanent Secretary, you've heard the same utterances I've just heard. Where does that sit with regards to best practice for the civil servant in procuring anything? And what would the procedure... Now, I know we're in unique times and very challenging times, and I wish you Godspeed, both of you, to find as much PPE as possible. But how does that conversation sit with regards to procurement and best practice and civil service standards? So, um, first of all, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to repeat, I think, a little bit about what the chairman said at the beginning. Um, you know, we are all working together, you know, to actually secure the very best amount of PPE that we can for here. And I think that is hugely important. I, I you know, was coming in this morning, listening to the radio and hearing of a nurse who um, was telling people that, you know, if one of their relatives is ill with this and they can't be there at the end, she will be there. And I just thought that was amazing. But obviously, you know, it makes you realise that she needs to have the right equipment to be able to do that. Um, the people that have been handling this in both the Department of Finance and the Department of Health. And it's been very much the two procurement teams working together, as the Minister has said, um, are specialists in this. I mean, this is, their, this is what they do day in, day out. And, you know, this procurement, this, this approach, um, all the procurement processes that we are following, they are all consistent with how we should do things. So they were talking to Dublin during that week. You know, first of all, I suppose I would just also say that, you know, I was really aware of the Department of Health, my colleagues there, actually across the public sector, the PSNI, prisons, they are all working flat out. And I'm, you know, we're in a great position in the Department of Finance to be able to offer support, to facilitate. We have got great people working in the department. And so, you know, when I was listening to what was happening in the Department of Health in particular and recognising the pressures that they were under, but also with the PSNI, I offered to help. I offered my, you know, the procurement people in the department to help colleagues and deal with this. So the Department of Health have been at the front of this with the Department of Finance. 
This is, you know, not, you know, this way this has been handled. We were discussing uh, all week our requirements with the, with the, you know, with Dublin. We gave them our requirements. That is fairly standard. What date was that? You gave them the requirements. Um, I think we were talking to them towards the in that week. We were talking to them during the course of that week, and then we gave them our requirements, fi you know, on the Friday. Um, so, um, you know, but this was a. Uh, this is the way that practice, the practice goes on. They are specialists. They know what they are asking for. They know what they are looking for. And that is how, that is how, this, that, that is how this practice and this process transpired during that week. How would you place a significant order for something before you would have an itemised list? That's something. There was, well, there was, we gave them a list. There was a list provided of what was being asked for. So in the in the, um, in the in the in the in the discussions, the requirements. So just on the time. So the 23rd of March was when the, was when the health and finance department started to work together. Yeah, it was a week. It was the beginning. It was the end of the week before that that I actually offered the uh, assistance of the Department of Finance. Yes. So, so what date then was the detailed list of requirements sent to Dublin? But well, I think it was it was a there was a discussion going on between Health, Department of Finance, and Dublin, and that was taking place over a, over a, over a course of a couple of days. And my, you know, I think it was on the it was on the Friday that the final. That the twenty seventh. Yep. Friday the twenty seventh, the final list was provided. So the twenty seventh is the day that the detailed list of requirements was sent. The final. Final, final, sorry, the final list, detailed list, was sent to Dublin. That was on the day, Minister, that you had told the media that mm -hmm. a very significant order for PPE had been made. Uh, and I quote you, we have the agreement with Dublin to jointly pursue this. We have the order placed. You also told ITV on that same day, this is a joint effort with the Dublin government. The order has been placed so I can give certainty in terms of the, f I can't, sorry, so I can't give certainty in terms of the flights, but we obviously want to get it here as quickly as possible. So that's the timeline. The list went down with a detailed itemised list of what we needed. You then had went to the press on the 27th, Friday 27th. But then on the 3rd of April, which was last Friday, the Republic of Ireland government stated we are ready to discuss any area where we can cooperate effectively north and south, including on procurement of PPE and critical supplies. So, and I'll, I'll add on, in relation to procurement, whilst, while it has, has not so far proved possible to place a joint order in the context of what is an increasingly challenging international environment. So it seems to be that what we thought we were placing, Dublin, Dublin, is ready to discuss weeks later. So when we sent through that list, what did we get back in return with regards to documentation? No, I think your interpretation again is incorrect. Uh, when we concluded on the, the statement you were talking about came from Dublin after we had concluded that we couldn't follow that route, that the supply lines that they had already been working through, that had already delivered supplies to the south, uh, that are continuing to deliver some supplies to the south, when they went back to activate them on behalf of a joint order in the early part of that week uh, and, and, and tried over a number of days and were back and forward with suppliers are eventually concluding on the 2nd of March. So that order uh, couldn't be concluded through that route. That's second, what they were saying. Just correct, 2nd of April. 2nd of April, sorry. Okay. That was the, uh, that's when they then subsequently said that we are, are happy to look and we're still happy to look with them at any procurement opportunities. So it wasn't the case that they hadn't got an order. We had agreed over the course of that week we had checked with the uh, Cabinet Office. We had taken the full quantum of the uh, Department of Health and the other uh, departments uh, that we were looking at, although we were looking at other supply chains for them as well, uh, and put that package together, sent it to Dublin, and were arranging a money transfer. So we, we had placed an order with them, which they were placing then in China on top of their own order. 
then, as it developed through the course of that week, that order couldn't be placed in China because the supply lines drive up. So, it's a, it's, if you want to interpret that an order was placed in China, or an order was placed with Dublin to go to China on the back of their already existing orders. So, how can you be confident, and, and how can this committee be confident, when you can't show any documentation? You, 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 I'm sure you can show the list and the list being sent. But what communications, what dialogue, what minutes, what emails bouncing from Belfast to Dublin is there that you can provide us with with regards to insurance? Because insurance is important. <coughs> Minister, you said... What are you looking at insurance of? Ins that we were talking to Dublin? That, that the order had actually been placed, that you, you were confident that Dublin was confident that they had received exactly what we needed. That there, well, there, 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 there is are, no uh, paper trail uh, here whatsoever. And it's you, have, you, have you asked for a paper trail? Well, well we're asking now. Ah, but you I mean, uh, <laughs> have you, you, have, you haven't asked for a paper trail. If there's a well, paper trail available if, if you wish to see one. Well, that would be really helpful, Minister. Well, if, uh, that, if, that, if that helps your, your well, level of faith, then we It is about confidence, that. because you said... Uh, in your budget statement on questions, I think it was to Mr. Given, my colleague. As, as he says, part of this is about giving confidence. Mm -hmm. Even in the documentation that we have received, the Health Department recognises that it is about morale as well as protection. So here we have nurses and frontline workers crying out for PPE. You were able to give them assurances, commitments through the press, in the House, and yet. You talk about documentation, yet we as a committee, scrutinising committee, have yet to see that documentation. So can you please produce that? You as a scrutinising committee have yet to ask for it. So to present it here is somehow a failing well, when you haven't asked well, for it, well, I think I is as, a bit perverse. I as an, I as an individual MLA have asked for it. I asked for it on the 1st of April via an email to your private office and to the Permanent Secretary's contact. I had asked a series of questions which are documented within this committee. And I have yet to receive even an acknowledgement of that. I asked, can the Department of Finance provide the contract and detail therein for the joint order of PPE uh, from China between the Northern Ireland Executive and the Government of the Irish Republic? Question mark. When was the contract agreed and signed and by whom? Question mark. How much is the Northern Ireland Executive paying and for what percentage of the PPE? Question mark. How much of the delivery that arrived at 3 p.m. on Sunday, the 20th of March, on Special Air Lingus Airbus A330 flight E19019 from Beijing was, has come to Northern Ireland? Question mark. What new supply chains for PPE has been established by the Northern Ireland Executive this year? What work has been completed, and what plans are in place to explore new supply chains? Question mark. Out of what budget stream is this money coming from? Question mark. I haven't received any of that. I haven't received an acknowledgement. Those are the pertinent questions that this committee is asking. And yet, you don't see right to bring us detail with regards to any documentation that has been to and froing from Belfast to Dublin. I think, uh, and I think the minister, is, you, you, the minister, excuse me, Mr. Minister, I think the minister and the, uh, the secretary have given an undertaking now to present that information to the yeah. committee. And, and I, I would welcome that as uh, quickly as possible. Can I say that your, your question in relation to the delivery of the flight from Ireland Lingus misunderstands that that wasn't part of our order? That the Irish government were in the game here several weeks before we were. Well, so they had their own supply lines yep. established and the delivery established. And I would understand the, that. But the new supply chains established by the Northern Ireland Executive this year, well, supply chains for PPE would have been the Department of Health's responsibility if they were attempting to supply, establish those this year. The budget stream that the money is coming from is the Department of Health's money. But we can get you answers to the other details. Yeah, that would okay. be very helpful. Just and one second. Just mal 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 just well, to you, uh, uh, I'm becoming really uneasy here that, uh, as a member of this committee, is presenting what was his personal demands as them reflecting what, in fact, this committee has asked for. We haven't even met as a committee to discuss this issue. It's been thrust on us. It's been thrust on us. And yet and all, a member of this committee continues to address the minister in a fashion whereby he... Uh, in relation to his own personal emails, as if he implies it's a reflection of the attitude of this committee. I just want to ha have that recorded that it's not. Thank you. That is noted. Um, however, I think because of the discussion that this committee is uh, having 
particularly about the provision of PPA and whether a contract was raised or not. I think that sort of information would be germane to the rest of the committee and sort of looking around sort of other members of the committee. I think we would welcome that information as swiftly as possible. Sorry, Mr. Freak, please continue. Uh, no, well, it, it, uh, um, there are other members here, and time is limited. But you know, this is not. This is, we are a scrutiny committee, but we are here also to provide assistance and support, and we would like to do that, Minister, and we would like to help you get as much PPE into this country as possible. Now, I must say, I have been disappointed in in the answers. And I have been disappointed in the demeanour even, because we're here to assist and help. And we're here to add confidence to our, to our vital staff members working on the front line. And you've uttered it yourself in your own statement when you said this is about giving confidence to those members. Now, when a media outlet had to talk to the nursing fraternity to tell them that that, that order is now non-existent, that is not inspiring confidence. So we're here to make sure that we can inject confidence into this system. Okay. Now we have PPE. We have PPE from from uh, the UK, and of course we'll get it from other sources. And I want to assist you guys in every way I can to get as much PPE from every source that we can into this country to provide the fight back against this virus. So please, Minister, work with us, us on this. I, 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 we, to say that we didn't ask for documentation. Surely, in transparency and Don't accountability, finish. that information should be forthcoming. It should be flowing from the department. We should not have to wrangle it out of anyone, including the minister or the permanent secretary. And I'm very disappointed that the an answer I get back was, you haven't asked for documentation, when clearly I, as an individual MLA, had. This committee, I'm sure, would be very interested in having that information, and it's yet not forthcoming. Well, can I say, firstly, in relation to your last point, let me pick up on some of your points. The committee have only asked me one thing, and that's to appear here today, which I have done at the earliest opportunity. They have not asked for any information whatsoever. You, as an individual MLA, not as the deputy chair of the committee, but as an individual MLA, have asked a series of questions, some of which actually pertain to the Department of Health, some of which are completely inaccurate because they pertain to another government in another how can, jurisdiction. How can a question be inaccurate, exactly. Minister? Through the chair. Uh, Sorry, because, how, how can a question because you have be asked a question of our department which actually does not apply. Firstly, some of them apply to the Department of Health. So uh, let me explain to you, and without interruption, please, in terms of responding to the email that you sent to the Department, that some of the questions do apply to the Department. Some of the questions apply to the Department of Health. Some of the questions apply to the Irish Government. So in order for us to gather up all of those responses and send them back to you, that would take some time. The committee itself has asked me one question to appear here today, which I have done. They did not ask me to bring any information with me other than to come and, and talk to them in relation to this issue. That's what I'm here doing. If the committee has asked me for further information, I chaired the Finance Committee in a previous time in this Assembly. I know exactly the response. I have been absolutely upfront and collaborative with the committee at every opportunity that I've had. And can I also say, in relation to your expressed desire, and I have no reason to doubt that, to, that the committee want to assist in relation to that. We have been inundated with emails from individuals, from businesses, offering support, offering contacts, offering supply lines to people they know. I haven't had any emails from most of the members of this committee to offer any of that at all. So I'm, I'm happy that the committee are now wishing to collaborate with us in relation because I've had, I've had emails from colleagues of yours, I've emails from colleagues of yours, Chairman, I've had emails from other uh, party members, but I haven't had any emails from anybody that I can recall. Uh, in relation to, uh, well, there are one or two from this committee, but certainly not yourselves. So, if there is to be a spirit of collaboration, we would greatly welcome that because that exists well beyond this committee. It exists across the political spectrum in the north, where we have been receiving contacts, emails, offers, suggestions, uh, people trying to assist. And if that's the spirit that you're in, then that's very much to be welcomed. And that may well start by communicating and responding to email or sent minister. Uh, it's not prevented. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, including many, many MLAs, MPs, councillors, and others, contacting the department with offers of assistance. They're not sitting back waiting for questions to be answered. The questions that you have asked the department a mere six days ago, seven days ago, involve not only our department; they involve the Department of Health, and they also involve the Irish government. Okay. So, so thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, today. Matthew. Are you there? Going to sleep. Matthew. 
Hi, Chair. I'm here. Uh, sorry, I'm disembodied. Am I audible to people? Yep. Yep. Can you hear him, Connor? Yeah, yeah, it's just yep. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks, Minister. Thank you to the Permanent Secretary. Thanks, fellow members. Um, I keep it brief since I'm not in the room. Um, uh, I would just say it's helpful to have the Minister here today. I respect and understand that the department, he and the department are trying hard to secure PPE. We appreciate that that's what everyone, is on everyone's agenda. And uh, hope the purpose of today's hearing is, or the outcome of today's hearing is that we have a clear understanding and people are on the same page. I just want to ask a couple of brief questions. The first one is really around um, the fact that the Irish government clearly has secured um, an order of PPE um, that landed um, last week. Um, is the implication or the understanding of the Northern Ireland Department of Finance that that is a different supply chain to the one that it was believed was a joint order was was coming a joint all island order was happening if you see what i mean so i guess my question is why has that order been placed uh why has that supply chain worked and is it a different supply chain that we were expecting to get one from okay well the the uh it's our from working on this it's our estimation that in order to quantify place identify suppliers, secure manufacturing, transport and fly an order back to this island, it would probably take in the range of a number of weeks. So you can be sure that the order which the Dublin government arrived last weekend was already in process uh, by, by our estimation at least a number of weeks, perhaps three, uh, but that's from our own experience of dealing with these matters. Uh, so clearly Dublin uh, government was in the field securing and, and procuring PPE at least a number of weeks in advance of the executive. Okay, and um, thank you, Minister. My um, so the next question I want to ask is really about specific difficulties that exist at the minute, um, rather than simply talk about the order that wasn't. What is happening as of now in terms of on the ground? What are the difficulties that are being faced by um, Invest NI or IDA or whoever it is? And can you talk us through that, exactly what the problems are? Well, the, the difficulties are faced are well documented. Uh, the United States has come into the market. It has uh, brought both its economic and political muscle into the market and is attempting to basically secure very, very significant uh, supply lines from China to satisfy its own demands. India has come into the market similarly with uh, a much stronger economic and political muscle to do likewise. Uh, supply lines which the Irish government had been operating off uh, very quickly dried up uh, and we spent some time with them trying to re-establish them or, or at least confirm that they were no longer available to us uh, and then to look for others. And what we've been doing since when we finally accepted last Thursday that those supply lines were gone and wouldn't be coming back is we have been using our own people out there, the experience of the IDA officials, uh, our people from the Bureau in Beijing, our Invest NI people who are on the ground there and people who are here who have extensive contacts in China to access alternative supply lines. And we are exploring some of those. We're also in, continuing to engage with Dublin, uh, certainly in terms of transport arrangements, uh, because they still have a number of flights booked to go to China and back over the, the common period. Uh, but we will continue to discuss them, of course, since the MOU is signed, uh, the, the issue of procurement, not only PPE, but other arrangements is very much in the agenda. And I think there is a, a, a meeting tomorrow between the First Deputy First Minister, senior ministers in the Dublin administration, including the Minister for Health, uh, and these issues have no doubt will be discussed there. But on the ground, we're attempting to identify, secure, and, and much work has been done on that since last Thursday, uh, since they uh, concluded that the supply lines that we were working off uh, had, had dried up. Thank you. And it would be helpful just to understand, going forward, precisely what the procurement structure is in relation to PPE and I guess other stuff is inside, particularly PPE is inside the executive. Is it is the, is the understanding correct that other departments um, are placing their orders for PPE with the Department of Finance at the minute? And is, is the expectation that those departments should continue to place their orders or 
what you know people working on the roads or people who work in schools maintenance they should be placing their orders with finance and they will fulfill them and distribute them yes at the outset when this when the pandemic obviously started to unfold health made it clear health of their own procurement team as you will understand they made it clear that they would in relation to ppe only procure for people that came in under the health umbrella uh, uh, and even at that, there were some questions among some of the services whether they were actually included, because obviously health's priority were for frontline uh, services who were who were who were dealing with the uh, pandemic. Uh, so we we accepted a responsibility to try and use our procurement experience uh, to try and secure supply for some of the others people I've listed, like the PSNA, uh, forensic scientists, uh, and others outside of that health system. Uh, and then we got into uh, as health then uh, came to us as seeking assistance on Monday the 23rd, I think it was, of March. Uh, we then got into a joint arrangement to try and assist with health in uh, providing this. So we continue to try and secure and source both locally, nationally, uh, uh, in Britain, uh, and uh, internationally PPE supply, not only for health, but for all the other services as well. So the, the understanding is correct then, basically, that as regards PPE, departmental responsibility for PPE in the health service is with the Department of Health, but in terms of dis dispersing PPE elsewhere and getting orders to, to via CPD to other bits of the executive and public service is finance. Well, yes, uh, sorry, so just to finish that point, the, uh, I mean, the, the PPE supply that has arrived on Monday this week from London uh, won't cover those other services. Uh, and that's why there is a necessity to continue to try and source. Plus, it, it obviously isn't sufficient, depending on how long the pandemic lasts for health itself. So we still have an instruction uh, from health to try and secure alternative international supplies of PPE, not only for them, but also for the other services as well. Sorry, Sue. No, and I was just going to say, we've, we've set up a multidisciplinary team in the Department of Finance, which comprises, you know, Health are on it, um, Invest NI, um, and you know we are other all other departments and agencies, but working with health are letting us know what their requirements are, and we are going out and you know seeing where that can best be provided from. Um, so it's a very collaborative working relationship. Um, and uh, but the I suppose those agencies or whoever they are, they remain ultimately responsible and accountable for their spend and their order. But we are helping procure that in, in, in the way that, you know, why have one, you need to have one conversation rather than 20, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, just, Minister, and sort of, that's very interesting, but where if we're not looking, trying to source from China and we're not sourcing from the rest of our country, where else are we looking? I think there's still some European options open to us. The yeah. uh, procurement team could give answers from this and that, but uh, my understanding there's some European options that they're still exploring as well. And we're, we're working with um, Manufacturing NI. I think coming back to the point you made at the beginning, Chairman, we are working with Manufacturing NI to establish, um, you know, to supply, supply routes, which will be longer term. Um, I mean, some of the items can be, they are doing them now, but I think there is also an issue here about for the future, for the longer term. And interestingly, the discussions that I had last week with the Department of Health in London, um, you know, they have sent over the specification for their gown, and we are we are now talking to local suppliers about you know how they might supply them longer term, and that would be that would be significant for here. Um, so they are the sort of discussions that we're having. We're having whatever it takes. We want to get the the best PPE. Yeah, we want to get all of this PPE in and out to the many people that need it. Is there any, sorry, just to yeah. uh, interrupt, is there any ongoing discussions, particularly with our friends in the Irish Republic? Because there may be some areas where we may have, and it's not anticipated at the moment, but there will be over the next couple of months, there may be areas where we have surplus. Is there any indications, because I understand they have got a significant shortage of PPE, and again, the problems they've had with the supply line in China, that some yeah. of their PPE has not been fit for purpose. Have they been in conversation with us and with the UK? I think UK? About, it's, it, the indications yeah. are that about 20 per cent of their, uh, as some would argue, 80 per cent in, in the current global scramble for PPE isn't so bad. Uh, but nonetheless, nobody wants to uh, ensure, we want to ensure that all public money is spent uh, to actual maximum benefit. Uh, but we're having ongoing discussions with them. There is a very close working relationship between the office of uh, procurement, public procurement down in the south, uh, and our own procurement team yeah. 
uh, in, in the Department of Finance. And yeah. Because, I mean, ultimately, if, if we face into a second pandemic, then the, the issues which, which previously governed procurement, such as the cost, uh, are now going to be, I think, balanced very much against security of supply, quality of material, uh, and the most secure supply we can find in the time ahead is on this island. Whether people regard this that constitutionally or not, but it's on this island. It means that whatever is, is manufactured here is a, a lorry right away from us, not a sea ferry crossing or an airplane flight away from us or in another market with other uh, business regulations and business laws. Uh, so I, very much our discussions have been, and, and with the Health Minister as well, and I've, I've discussed this with him, have been about looking to the future and building up as much as we can uh, a quality supply here uh, close to home so that we, uh, should we face another pandemic, then we're not you know, the small little player that we are globally in the same battle place as people like America and India and other huge economic partners trying to scramble for the same supply lines. Okay, and just before Gemma, I would add an apostrophe at the end of Ireland. Thanks very much, today. Gemma. The work and taking up acts responsibility during this time, um, but I just want to question the minister. Um, you or maybe Sue, I don't know who said it, but you said the department offered assistance on Thursday the 19th, um, but that wasn't agreed until Monday the 23rd. Why was there a delay? Well, the the I think the response we got was that the uh, procurement of PPE wasn't an issue. It was the management of stock and distribution was an issue. Uh, it was only then on Monday when the uh, when the department came forward to us and said they did need help with okay. the procurement of PPE, and then we very quickly got working on that. Okay, no, that's grand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Hello. Thank you, Philip. I'm Sean Henry. I always uh, said uh, really going faster. Uh, Minister, you're very welcome here today, as is your Prime Secretary as well. Um, he said, "Speak up." Just even at a, like at the micro uh, level. Uh, could you speak up, please? We can't pick up on that. Speak to the mic. The mic. Mic's there. There's a mic down, is it? Yeah. Just even at the micro level. Yeah. Uh, I know that I was involved in talking to O'Neill at the outset, and that was about uh, the delivery of uh, scrubs and the likes of it. And wasn't it just some time after that we'll say uh, our executive uh, and our minister and that would have eventually then secured contracts and that with O'Neill's to meet that demand. Uh, and I'm sure then at the macro level, it's very, very similar in many respects. It starts off with people sort of dialoguing with each other and uh, looking at what it is that is possible. And that uh, I totally accept uh, the explanation by the minister and how it was um, affected by the international market in terms of delivery of uh, uh, equipment here to Ireland itself. Now, um, I think too that uh, the minister uh, is quite obvious has done has utmost in every respect to secure uh, the equipment that we require and has worked diligently and, and cooperatively with the Department of Health as well to, to be commended for that minister in every respect. And one point I'd also like to just note as well that uh, whenever you had said there about the uh, equipment that was common say at the present time, even from England and so on, that it didn't extend then to the likes of um, care workers and those in uh, residential homes and so on. So uh, that you again too have noted that and you, you, you recognise the need for uh, provision for those people. And I think that that's a priority. Even well, the could I just time. say, Malisha, that the Department of Health issued a kind of, I think, a, a, I'm not sure if it was a statement or because I'm not sure it was a document that we saw at an exact level where they listed a number of groups and uh, they did include domiciliary care and they did include, mm. now whether that includes people in the independent sector of domiciliary care or homes, I'm not certain, and that's probably a question for the Department of Health, but it was a broader list than perhaps we had originally understood, which was basically frontline hospital workers. So there are a, it's, a, it's our assessment that, that that covers most of the people under the kind of broad health umbrella that they have, but there are other services outside of that that don't fall within the ambit of the health department that continue right. to have a need. So I'm very, very glad to hear that, but the person I'm just in that my own mother is in a, a private home at the present time. Uh, uh, but can I also go on, Minister, then just, uh, and I think it's more important rather than looking at who said what or who done what at what point in time, and there will be plenty of time for inquests on ahead down the line, but uh, what I think is more uh, pertinent at the present time, in terms of um, uh, coronavirus testing, um, 
and it's quite evident even from some of the latest statements, even only uh, today again, how important it is to curtail the development of this virus in every respect, with the uh, help of, uh, our, of coronavirus testing as well too. What steps have been taken uh, uh, in order to procure that type of test for the people here in the North of Ireland? Well, our own procurement team, I mean, the, the approach we have taken in relation to this is to try and help other departments. Uh, that, that's what we and Sue offered. I think it came from a CCG meeting yeah, we in the morning a, where the other services yeah. were present, where yeah. we, we, we could hear from other services asking, what about us and PPE, what about us? And they weren't really getting the answer. So we discussed it. We were both at the meeting, yeah. and we said we should go and undertake to try and assist people in getting that. The PSNI is responsible for the Department of Justice, uh, but they clearly weren't getting a uh, prison service, uh, forensic scientists, other people. So our approach has been to try and assist other people. Then eventually the health department came to us for assistance also, and we had offered that uh, before that. I had, I had spoken to the health minister. I had written him a letter telling him that any uh, assistance that he required, both in terms of making finances available or indeed whatever support our department could give him, was at his disposal. And, and we recognised first and foremost that this was a health crisis, uh, and we, the safety of people was the number one priority in relation to that. Uh, and similarly, we have we have also explored then other areas where we could be helpful, including testing. And um, we had looked at testing supply uh, from a company in the United States, uh, yeah. and we had agreed, cleared if the money was approved by, or if the order was approved by the Department of Health, that we would clear the money to do that. But they told us that they didn't think it was certified, and they hadn't got a community testing policy at that stage. Now I'm glad. It seems to be that the British government is shifting more, given some of the utterances yesterday, towards a testing policy. I think that's to be welcomed, uh, because it seems that our decisions flow uh, from that. Uh, we also had looked at the Randox supply, uh, and I, I think we had engaged with them, uh, uh, and we were told again by the Department of Health that it wasn't certified. Uh, it was certified, I think, on the on the Friday evening, and the, the British government has effectively secured the supply by the weekend. I think uh, I can be correct on that, but it was very, very shortly after that when it was certified. Uh, and so, there is an ongoing discussion between the Department of Health and the, the government in London as to how and when we get access to whatever proportion of that it is agreed uh, that we we will get. Uh, but we have been doing, in, in terms of testing, really just searching the markets, offering suggestions to the Department of Health. It's obviously their decision. Uh, and I mean, we couldn't have procured or, or placed the order with Dublin on the Friday evening. It was the Department of Health's order, effectively. We were, if you like, the, the, the midwife for, for that process. Uh, so it's their order. They have to say, yes, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, and similarly with testing or any other equipment, should it be ventilators or anything else, the Department of Health uh, would have to tell us to go ahead and make the order. But we are constantly, our procurement team, because of the knowledge they have and the contacts they have, and this multidisciplinary team, as Sue has said, working with Invest NI, working with others, working with people in the South, uh, we're constantly out there looking to see where things are, what price things may be, are they certified, will they be of help. So if the Department of Health does come forward to us at some stage and say, yes, we would like, we can go very quickly and get that. That's what we've been trying to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there anything to add to that, Sue? No, no. I mean, I think we're all just, we are, just as the Minister has said, just all trying to do our very best to get what we can, know what is, know what is available, know what's on the market, and that's what the teams are all trying to do. And, sir, yeah, and just uh, make the comment that uh, day and daily I am contacted by people who effectively uh, are encouraging uh, the executive not to move forward uh, in the whole area of testing and that as well. They, they would easily say that the world evidence points to it as a, a way of actually help to curtail the development of the disease. And they also make the comment as quite obvious as well too that uh, already uh, in the Republic that in two and three weeks ahead of us here in the north is as simple as that. And a lot of this is all down to testing. Well, the, the, the health policy areas are a matter for health, the health departments. So they have to decide. Uh, that's, uh, if the executive, by a very strong majority, decided they wanted the health, I'm sure they would react to that. But uh, at the moment, the operational issues in relation to health and the policy they follow is a matter for the Department of Health. We can assist them if they tell us they want us to get something we, when we're preparing to assist them in every area that they might request. Uh, but we can't act unless we have the authority of the health department. Okay. Jim? You're telling us that as far as your department was concerned, there was no order between you and the Chinese. Is that fair? 
Well, what I'm telling you is that the department decided that the, the, yeah, I was advised by the department that a uh, procurement line had been set up and was working between Dublin and China, and that a good way to try and secure us supply from China rather than going out with the limited team. I think we have two invest NA people on the ground and perhaps two people in the Bureau in, in a vast country. The best way to do it, IDA have much more people on the ground and the Irish Embassy have more people on the ground. They had established the supply line. They were already in the process of receiving S supply. Sorry, just to finish the point. Uh, and they were already in the process of beginning to receive, as we saw that weekend, uh, some supply arrived. That the best way to do that was to place an order with Dublin, which would add to their order, to come back through the same supply network. Yeah, and that's what we had done: was to place an order with Dublin to be advanced, agreed with by them, advanced as a part of their order, uh, to, to supply back into Ireland, and then would be we would get our portion of it when we arrived back. So the, the contracting parties would be the Dublin government yeah. and the Chinese. Yes. But what do you and that's why we were making the transfer to the, through the to department the government, yeah. in Dublin. We yeah. weren't playing directly the Chinese, we yes. were playing the Dublin government. But what you told the Assembly last Tuesday was you spoke of a joint order yes. with the government in Dublin, yes. which is very suggestive that the, you two were to be a contracting party. Well, joint order with the government in Dublin then with the Chinese. Well, again, I go back to maybe my initial exchange with the chair. You may put your interpretation on what I said, but what I said was factually correct. We were placing a joint order with Dublin. Dublin was placing an order for supplies for PPE. No, Minister, what you said was, as of last week, we have a joint approach to PPE procurement. Yeah. The one that is identified in the joint order yeah. with the government in Dublin. Yeah. Uh, to anyone listening and reading, that would convey that you, as the Northern Ireland executive or a party to it, were part of an order with the Chinese, a joint mission, a joint order with Dublin, Belfast and the Chinese. Well, I can suggest that you are splitting hairs. If we placed and agreed a joint order with Dublin, in which Dublin would be the contracting party, we would pay them, they would use the supply lines they were already established, they would bring back that material, and that we, they would give us, when they arrived, what we had paid them for. Well, that, for me, is a joint order. Okay. Well, how then do you explain the article in last Saturday's Irish Times on the headline, HSE confirms no joint order for PPE with Northern Ireland, and quotes Dr. Colum Henry, HSE Chief Clinical Officer, said he was not aware of any joint PPE procurement between the Republic and the North. That doesn't tell me with what you told the House, that you had a joint order with Dublin, if Dublin is saying, never heard of it. Well, I can assure you Dublin did hear of it. So I, I'm, I, I can't explain how the Irish Times write their stories, but uh, can I say, that we had an agreement to, we sent down the list of our requirements that a, a joint order would be placed. Uh, we were in the process of transferring the money uh, early the following week. So technically the position, and if somebody said on Thursday evening or Friday morning the, uh, there was no joint order, there wasn't at that stage because the order hadn't been able to be placed. Well, sir, I think Dr. Colm Henry was saying that he was not aware of any joint PPE procurement? Well, I can't explain. I, I don't know the official involved, and I can't explain for him. But I can tell you that if we were in the process having a secured agreement, a secured agreement from the Cabinet Office who told us to go ahead, it was the Health Department's money, and we were in the process of, of transferring that, or arranging transfer to Dublin, then it was on the basis of a joint order with Sorry, them. Minister, just just some clarification, just one second. So the Cabinet Office, so we got approval from the Cabinet Office to spend the money. No, no we, we, we went to the Cabinet Office to see whether this was an approach that, you know, we, what we didn't know was how So we weren't trampling over somebody else trying to do the same thing? Exactly. Um, partly, yeah, mostly that, but also to understand what we were likely to get from them. Um, so we went and said, you know, look, we're thinking about, you know, doing this. What do you think? They said, you know, do it. Okay. Um, because uh, if, if the Cabinet Office, if the British Government were had intent or had secured a very sufficient supply, then 
we may not have needed to follow that route. And that's why we, we if we like, uh, got uh, dialogue with them on the Friday evening and then agreed to make the order. So but, I, I'm not sure. In terms we will be just just to, just to, to make sure we we get this one. So obviously you will be able to furnish us with the sort of the email trail that we had with the uh, whoever you were doing it through in the Irish Republic, so we'd know the orders and sort of the timelines and the amount that was about yeah. to be provided. If that's what the committee requests, and yep. yeah. I think we shall. Yes. Over and over again. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, Jim. Keep going. One of the things that's puzzled me about this from the outset, Minister, is you say this order was placed with Dublin, but at every turn until today, I think, you have declined to say what was ordered. Now, if you place an order, what's the secret about what it is you've ordered? Why did you constantly take refuge in, it's a very significant order, but declined to say what was ordered. Can you explain that? Well, as I said, I think I said in response to a question in the Assembly, is that uh, we are ensuring, this is my answer, I think it was to Mr O'Toole, actually, uh, that we are ensuring that the appropriate people on the ground to make sure that the order or is secured that the equipment we need and that it meets the specifications that are required. There is no point in importing to find it's not what we need or what we ordered. Before we get into the detail of the exact quantities, which are significant, we want to ensure that we have the right order secured and on its way home. Then we will be able to release it. You have told us for £170 million. Which would have been lodged with Dublin. Uh, it, but, it wasn't going but, to China. Right, it wasn't going to China. But you hadn't seen what you were getting. We've heard since that maybe 20% of what China is supplying is unfit. And you were going to write a cheque for £170 million for goods you hadn't seen? Well, I think anybody who places an order like that from China is based on the, on the, the fact that there are people on the ground to try and establish the, qual the quality of it, the quantity of it, and to make sure. And I, uh, I would imagine, that, given the experience Dublin has had with that, that they will be pursuing those who supplied them with deficient goods uh, for that. We were operating on the back of an established supply line, which was working uh, for the, the South, uh, albeit the, there was, uh, I'm told, and that's again by media reports, not by people involved in Dublin, that there were some, perhaps 20% of it wasn't. Uh, so that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to act fast. We were trying to protect people who were in the front line. We were trying to support a request for help from the De Department of Health, who had previously told us that it was a stock management issue, but then told us that there was a need for a significant amount. We had checked to see was the likelihood of, of that uh, quantity of a PPE going to come from London. We were told, go ahead with your order which to me indicates that they weren't certain that they were going to be able to supply. And I would suggest that every government in the world that is dealing with China is facing into the same issues, that they are going out to place orders to try and meet a very sudden and huge demand back home to protect lives, and that in doing so, they are taking certain risks to, to ensure that they get the right amount and the right quantity, and they have to try and manage those risks. That's what government departments do. Before you saw a single apron, or mask or anything else, you were ready, about to send the money to Dublin. To Dublin. That's correct, is it? Yes. And who were you ordering for? Because the other thing that's puzzled me about this is, you told the Assembly last Tuesday that the Department of Health had their own procurement and you were ordering for other public services. This was prior to the Monday the 23rd of March. What you, what you said was, when it comes to PPE procurement, the member will know that the Department of Health is responsible for its own procurement. Yeah. What we undertook to do initially, because there was significant demand from other services, the Blue White services, including the police, ambulance, fire brigade, forensic scientists, was to procure PPE for all outside the Department of Health. Yes. And that's so, what I've said repeatedly. On the 23rd of March, on the, on the 18th and the 19th of March, we formally asked the Department of Health, could we assist them in in getting PPE. They told us no, they didn't require it. It wasn't a procurement issue, it was a stock management issue. And on Monday, the 23rd of March, they came to us to ask us for assistance. So from that point on, we became involved with the Department of Health in procurement. So what you sent on the 27th of March included their needs as well as other needs? 
What I said is, initially we were involved in procuring PPE for all other services outside the Department of Health, at our own suggestion, following a CCG meeting, yes. uh, when we understood other services were struggling, yeah. uh, and that whatever Department of Health were doing wasn't going to cover them, they weren't going to order for other people outside their own department. Uh, we undertook to step in and assist other services. Uh, that then broadened out when the Department of Health asked us to support them in securing their PPE on the 23rd of March. But there was only one list sent, and it included everyone's needs. Well, I need to establish the exact quantities that I know we have also been uh, pursuing other, uh, because what you have with PS and I have a different requirement from perhaps ambulance service, from fire service, from forensic scientists. There are different specifications. So we have managed in terms of PS and I to get, yes. I to get uh, supply to them. So that wasn't part of the China uh, proposition. Uh, so I don't know the exact breakdown in terms of what all was required in, in that. I mean, we were. I think we spent. You know, we were spending time collating the various requirements from the different uh, departments, agencies. But the health department were the main. Um, I suppose you know, the, the main amount of this would be for the health department. And the list that went to Dublin on the 27th was health plus others. Yeah. yeah. But what the exact quantity of others was, I would need yeah. to look at the. You told Mr. Frew that the uh, procurement was in line with processes, with process. Now, I must say, having heard evidence in this committee from procurement people in the past, they, if you might characterise it, are very fastidious. They're very rule-bound. You're quite happy that when we see all of the procurement documentation, it will satisfy all those requirements yeah. and you're undertaking to let us see all that procurement yeah, so, I mean you know we have followed um, you know we're following proper process we're doing it at pace and I think everybody will understand why we're doing it at pace um, but you know we have followed we have followed the processes no and the corrections involved no no thank you thanks Jim uh, minister um, on the 27th of uh, March you said we today agreed a joint order with Dublin. There's a big procurement going on in the British system as well, but I think it would be prudent. We want to ensure that if a crisis that is coming our way becomes more severe in Britain and those supply lines across the Irish Sea start to dry up, that we have our own supplies. And you added, this is a joint effort with the Dublin government. The order has been placed, so, but I can't give certainty in terms of the flights. But we will obviously want to get, get it here as quickly as possible. Now, that was your, situ that was your situation on Friday, the 27th of March. At some stage between the 27th of March, sorry, the, yeah, the 27th of March and the 2nd of April, the penny must have dropped either with you or your permanent secretary that your optimism on that Friday was misplaced. When did you start to realise that things were going astray? Well, I think from the, we were always aware, and this is a moving day by day global pandemic, and the impact in other countries is increasing day by day. So we were always aware uh, that the likelihood was that America, who had a remarkably similar experience perhaps to the, the British cabinet, would wake up to the, the depth and extent of this crisis at a late stage and suddenly frantically become involved in trying to address the issues. We were also aware that India perhaps hadn't also woke up to the extent of the crisis. And, I mean, we're following this internationally, and, and, and like all of us, I suppose, we're a lot more knowledgeable about these things and the global impact of these things than we were perhaps a, a short number of weeks ago. Uh, and we were aware that uh, should those economic superpowers come into the race with China, uh, in China for PPE, then that would make it a very difficult market to try and procure from for a place as small as this even a place as small as a joint order on the island of Ireland. Uh, and so that was always in, in the back of our minds. Uh, the Irish government officials were leading the, uh, the approach on the ground in China, so we were getting daily and sometimes hourly report back uh, over the early part of the following week. And sometimes it looked like things were okay, other times things were getting a bit uh, you know, less positive looking. Uh, and so we were obviously putting all our efforts into securing the supply lines that were existing. Uh, and that went back and forward over the course of the week. And that, that's why when I was asked for some certainty and detail and timelines in the Assembly on the Tuesday that I was uh, up to in the budget statement, 
uh, that I, I did put in in relation to all those things about the certainty, about needing to secure it, about needing to make sure the quantity was right, needing to make sure it was on its way home before we would go out and say it to the public, and particularly those who had been crying out, as I'm sure you're aware, saying that they hadn't got enough, they weren't getting supplied with PPE on the front lines and all of that. And so I added in uh, to make sure that that we were, there were reservations in, in my commentary on the Tuesday, but we continued to pursue it with all we could, and Dublin uh, officials on the ground were continuing to pursue that until Thursday afternoon when we had uh, confirmation that that had finally come to an end. We had an executive meeting on the Friday morning, uh, which I then was duty bound to report to, so I hadn't gone out in public. Unfortunately, then other sources from within the government went to the media on Friday morning uh, and reported details of the attempt to uh, secure the order, and uh, then we dealt with the aftermath of it on the Friday evening. But my first duty was to bring to the executive uh, the report at Friday lunchtime, uh, and others then decided to go to the media earlier that morning. I put it to you, Mr Murphy, that had the Stephen Nolan show on the morning of the Friday the 3rd not released this information because they had obtained documents from the Irish authorities to say that the, the order was effectively was never going to be delivered, that it was that that prompted you to go public to admit that the, that the order was never going to happen, rather than any willingness to inform the public? Well, can I say you couldn't be further from the truth. The CCG reports every single day. The, uh, the department has an input into a, 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 the COVID dashboard, I think this is called, yeah. every single day across all of the departments report on all of the issues relating to COVID every day to a wide range of people within the government sector. And we get updates every single evening in relation to across all the range of departments as to where things are and what are red lighted and yellow lighted and green lighted to things that aren't a pressure. So there's absolutely no way that it could have been contained or I would have wanted to contain that that was a problem. I took it to the first executive meeting following the information that I had. We discuss the acquisition of PPE, I think, at every single executive meeting. I report back, the health minister reports back, uh, the officials meet every single morning at the CCG group in which all these issues are discussed. Uh, and as I say, a report is produced on a daily basis for all executive ministers where all of these issues uh, and departments are obliged to give updates in relation to where they are with all these issues. So the idea that we were somehow trying to, and I know nobody else has suggested this apart from you, but the idea that you are purporting that in somehow we were holding back on information if it hadn't been for some media expose is frankly nonsense. And it couldn't have been done uh, to any extent because at 12 o'clock that day, I was reporting back to executive colleagues. Uh, and I don't spend my morning sitting listening to radio shows. I spend my morning working with my procurement team in the department. So I wasn't fully aware of what had been said on the radio anyway. Uh, but I was reporting back by lunchtime to executive colleagues. And I went out on my own volition that evening at the press conference up the stairs and faced the media, took questions. I went on to BBC that evening and did an in-depth interview in relation to this and took questions. So what you're putting to me has no basis in either fact or or any other supposition you might have. When well, you became aware on the Thursday, could you not have contacted the executive members, informed them of the situation, and then told the public before it was released on the media? Well, I think it's a matter of regret that people from within inside government here went to the media and briefed them on this, because the, the proper place for everyone to receive that. Uh, there, was, there was indeed one other department that knew of the issues because we were both jointly uh, engaged in this procurement exercise. Uh, and it was a matter of uh, we were informed on Thursday evening, uh, Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, that this eventually, finally, was no longer going to be possible. We had an executive meeting about 12 hours or 15 hours later, and we were bringing it to that executive. Uh, the fact that some other government department, I think, probably should be your main source of concern that another government department might go to the media and brief them in relation to this uh, and, and uh, attempt to create some sort of storm around this, when it was simply a matter of an order placed, put in good faith, sub subject then to global uh, economic forces, which then became unstuck, which we were continuing to try and, and successfully pursue in China, uh, that that would become a story rather than the fact that uh, you know, another government department decided to go out and, and brief the media in relation to it. Well, okay. uh, maybe sorry, the, Jim, have you, have you got a further short Just one, one last short, short. question. Uh, maybe the lesson for the future minister is that you don't make any statement announcing a great uh, order for PP or anything else 
until you're absolutely certain it's tied down, signed, seemed and delivered, because you built up false hopes amongst the staff in both the private and the public sector, which were dashed. Well, in the last week alone, I have heard several executive ministers, including from your, well, I'm not sure if it's your current or your former party, former. but I'm not sure what your status is, but uh, I've heard executive ministers announce schemes that they are going to have funded, that the executive is going to fund for them, announce a scheme, another scheme that was going to be funded uh, that I was going to approve. I hadn't at, at that stage even received a letter from the minister. Now, I could go out and talk about all of that if I want, but what I'm I think trying minister, to do... Minister, it's safe to say there's been a lot of parties who have been doing that across the, yeah. across the piece. Yeah. And, uh, I think just just for the sake well, of can, can just, I finish? For, just for the sake of brevity, Pat, do you want to come in? Can I finish just my point of making because I've been asked a question, and um, if you afford me the opportunity to finish. So what I'm saying is, what we have demonstrated at the outset, in relation to the work we've been doing with other departments, is actually collaborative approach across an executive, which actually works. So I have been out uh, issuing statements on this, that, and the other. This was a very significant uh, uh, announcement. Sorry, hold on. Sorry, Minister. Yeah, I'll here. just finish Sir, the point. Minister, I'm if, you I'm just always... wait, if you just wait, Pat, go ahead with your question. We're under attack. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for coming in today as well, and to the Permanent Secretary and for your very clear answers, sir, and for the guarantee again that, uh, as we've already said, we're all working and we're all in this together, especially for the weeks ahead that we've been this. Minister, just a little question. Uh, it's doing with the, the business, you know, the tourism and the retail grant, and they're not really being worked on yet. Could you maybe just give us an update, if possible, uh, by yourself or by uh, the permanent secretary, when you hope to have them out and up and running? Well, it's actually the Department of Economy that has them out, Pat, but I'll let, uh, Sue can tell you where the detail is. I understand, I understand that, Minister, but I was wondering. I know that the money that, that, that were there are raised for them, and I know that those that have applied for them, I was just wondering, did you have an update? Because we're waiting on that coming from the executive, and I have asked the, the Minister of the Economy in order to pass that on. I, just... so I think we um, uh, have... Pro so there's two, two parts to this grant. There is the £10,000 bus small business grant, which we are processing through the Land and Property Service. And I think the latest figures are about 13,000 grants have been paid, about 130 million. The £25,000 grant, which is for retail, hospitality and leisure, um, I think we are, uh, the Economy Department have advised they're going to get the definition to us this week. Um, and then the Land and Property Service will process those uh, on the back of that. So it's, it's an economy lead. Um, with us delivering delivering that service for them, and I think that that also is an example, I think, of what we've talked about at the beginning, where you know we um, the Department of Finance role could be very narrow, um, and we could sit back and actually take a very narrow approach. I think all of you who would know how we work, that isn't what we want to do in the department, and actually on the small business grants, you know, that was a lot of our work to develop that with the Department for the Economy, and we are now distributing that. Um, and as soon as we get the definition and we can then uh, work out the businesses that will get the 25,000, we will also distribute that as well. Okay. Are you happy, Pap? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sort of, um, Minister, uh, Permanent Secretary, um, thank you very much indeed for coming in today. And having listened to the evidence, and at least from my position, I am sort of content in that for what for some of us presumed it might have been some form of misrepresentation, as you yourself said, Minister, is that listening to the evidence and bearing in mind the circumstances we're in at the moment, I have no doubt that you were doing your best and trying to do your best in particularly trying circumstances. And I wanted to make clear that I particularly welcome the increased cooperation between particularly between the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Health, to deal with this situation. And I don't think anybody in the Assembly or anybody in this committee wishes anybody ill will, particularly if it was all done for the best of intentions. And procurement situation at the moment, I think, as we can all imagine, is going to be particularly... Uh, the rule book has probably been thrown out the window. But it's vitally important that if we are ordering significant amounts of PPE from any position that we have, is we get the right equipment that is actually fit for purpose for the people we want. 
And in many respects, I think, on behalf of the committee, and at least on behalf of myself, I would like to spend, send my thanks on to the Department, to the Minister, and to yourself, and to the team for being able to help deliver what we have been able to. However, there are, as you can imagine, there are some questions that remain, and some of the questions that we have, we would like to see from the documentation that has been requested from this meeting, and we would like to see that as soon as possible. Uh, Minister, I apologise that we won't be able to give you more detailed and focused questions, but you probably weren't aware that our normal clerk is uh, currently sort of self-isolating due to the issues he has with people in his family. And I'm sure you will join with us, passing on our regards to him as well. Absolutely, you did pass on my regards to Jim. Tell him I was asking about him. Okay. Uh, just one final thing: um, when we were having the discussion, one of the reasons why we're in this position is that, particularly, the Deputy First Minister, in her own statements. She said about a contract being signed. Now, one of the things I think would be of being able to clarify a lot of issues as Minister, if you would have been able to say to her then that that wasn't the case, because some of the issues we've had over the particular last week, particularly in confidence in both the health minister, the health system, and also in procurement as well, has been built around the assumption that, in some ways, government wasn't pulling together. And I would say, and I would ask you, as Minister and as the Department, as we'll ask all the departments and the Assembly itself, to pull together during this time of crisis. And I think you've alluded to, and I think this is the thing that's quite clear, is that we're going through a peak at the moment. But what happens now, six months and 18 months downstream, is going to be equally as important. And I wish you all Godspeed and to keep safe. But Minister, Permanent Secretary. Thank you very much. Okay. Can I just say that I uh, thank you very much for having me in. I was uh, uh, very happy to come in and, and discuss this issue with you. And what we have demonstrated, I think, and Sue has, has remarked on as well, is the practical working together across the departments, which we have demonstrated in the Department of, of Finance. We haven't always been out talking about it, but we have demonstrated there are very few departments that we have not offered assistance to and placed at their disposal. Uh, Sue said we could have sat in the Department of Finance. We have an hour enough remit at times, but we've been out there trying to help people. Oh, no, uh, I, don't, I can't imagine trying, either of you two just sitting there. <laughs> trying just to act out. above and beyond. Uh, and that's practical working together executive. I have to say, in relation to policy issues, it's no surprise we disagree on them. Uh, we'd like to, and I think we're getting to a point where we can finally agree on the direction of travel in relation to the health response to this pandemic. But we, uh, it's no surprise that we have a different approach. That approach is changing, I think, uh, even indicated by the, the Downing Street press conference yesterday. seems to be new thinking is dawning, and that's to be welcomed. Uh, and I look forward to the day when we're all on the same health policy approach, as well as that constructive working across the executive. Sir Paul. Just looking to the future, Minister and Prime Secretary, can I ask the Chair, has an order now been placed through the links with Dublin? And if it hasn't been placed yet, are you still hopeful that a, an order can be placed for more PPE in that regard? And also, are you continuing to work with the government procurement uh, people for further PPE from uh, the rest of the GB? Yeah, well, can I say we're exploring all options? Uh, and one other thing to bear in mind is Dublin still have the transportation links, uh, which are very, uh, uh, very difficult to arrange if we don't we don't have a, a national airline to fly in and out uh, for us. So uh, we're exploring all options and we're keeping the dialogue open with Dublin. Uh, we are continuing to engage with the Department of Health and through Sue into Cabinet Office and other places in London to make sure that they are, they understand fully what we have in terms of PPE, the health department has, what its requirements are, because it's one thing to say we have five million items. How long does that last? You know, five million sets of gloves may not last a long time. So we need to understand from the Department of Health what they have, how long it will last at the height of a pandemic, uh, what the future requirements are going to be. And then that allows us both in terms of dealing with London, in terms of dealing with internationally, including China, and in terms of dealing locally, trying to get manufacturers engaged to know what the requirements will be, because it's going to be very hard for a lot of manufacturers to repurpose and say, we will get involved in supplying this and find that what they're doing is not required. So we need a clear understanding, and that's always been our engagement, and that's why we're, we're happy to set the joint uh, group, uh, multitask group, to do that, because we need to understand what the requirements are, how much, how long it will last, what future requirements are likely to be in order to secure the right amount. 
Thank you very much, Commissioner. Sorry, and I think you discovered from Willie Walsh that both our national airlines are owned by the same company. Yeah. Can I just say, can I just, can I just, sorry, I know I shouldn't probably say this, but, you know, just to add something, I think a really good example is what we did do around um, working with the Department of Health in London for our Department of Health colleagues here. I picked up the phone to the most senior official there, you know, and said what we needed and we needed it urgently. And actually, he put me in touch with the with the guy that was dealing with it. We actually had a conversation with him. But, you know, I was, you know, calling him, getting that order, you know, which finally came through. And that was, you know, on that, you know, all through the week. I, I will do whatever is needed. I work weekends, whatever is needed to deliver that. And I think it is an example of how we are collaborating. And we are all in this together. And I think we that is the way we've got to come through this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just before we sort of wrap up, I just want to give you the date and time of the next meeting, uh, Wednesday the 22nd of April at 2.30 in the Senate Chamber. That's uh, the next scheduled meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.